Shall we pray for God's help? Heavenly Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit you'd be with us here now and that this written word would become for us your living word and that we would have uh, soft uh, hearts and open ears uh, to hear what you would have to say to us tonight and be willing to obey. For your glory's sake, amen. Uh, Why are we doing Haggai this evening? We um, at Grace Church have done uh, over the years a few Bible overviews and this is a great sermon to fit towards the end of the Old Testament section of a Bible overview when you're looking at the whole sweep of the Bible. And it seems like a good time of year as we're in Advent to look at uh, these fulfilments of these prophecies that were being made by uh, the Old Testament prophets and to uh, look forward to seeing how they were fulfilled in Christ and how we're still waiting for them to be fulfilled. So that's the reason why I chose uh, this little passage from Haggai. Uh, But I'd like to do something a little bit different to perhaps normal. Remember, the prophets were given direct messages from God. And so I hope that by doing it the way that I'm going to, which I haven't yet told you uh, what that's going to be, that it'll help you to read and understand the context of the prophets and to see that they also saw and spoke beyond their time to the coming of Christ and even beyond that to the still-awaited second coming of Christ. And I'm going to do that by speaking in the first person as if I am one of the prophets, which I'm not, please don't think I am, but as if I'm Haggai. So certainly for the first part of the sermon, you've got to imagine that perhaps I've got, I, I don't know, I always imagine Old Testament prophets to have big beards and look, look wise and that kind of thing. Uh, so here we, here we go. Are you ready uh, for me to be speaking Haggai? Good evening. My name's Haggai. You may not know me, but when you get to heaven... I'll be the one who comes up to you and says, have you read my little book? (laughs) And it seems most people haven't when they get to heaven. It's just a small book, and at least you can say now you've read over half of it. And it's God's word, all right. He gave me the words to say, I remember it distinctly. It was the first day of the sixth month, what you call the 29th of August, in the second year of the reign of King Darius. He's the big cheese of the mighty Persian Empire who now rule our land. But more about that later. As I said, I'm one of the last Old Testament prophets. We've been called covenant watchdogs or covenant enforcers. Now, you only need a watchdog when things are going wrong. In the same way, us prophets only really appeared on the scene when the people, normally led by a wayward king, moved away from keeping the great agreements, the great and wonderful promises and covenants that the living God, Yahweh, had made with us, his people. And us prophets were sent to stop things going wrong. You see, it's no accident that when we appeared on the scene in the time of the Old Testament kings, that we're God's gift to God's people to counterbalance the extraordinary power vested in any king. God realised that his chosen people wanted kings so that they would be like the other nations around them. But God realised that these kings would be too strong, both for their own good and for the people's good. So he sent us prophets to counterbalance their potential for evil and corruption. As the saying goes, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So when Samuel, the first of us prophets, stood up to King Saul, the king wills. When another of my predecessors, Nathan, stood up to mighty King David and rebuked him for his adultery and murder, well, even King David wilted and repents. When Elijah, one of the big guns of us prophets, burst onto the scene when King Ahab and Jezebel led the people astray to worship false gods and that horrible god Baal, well, even King Ahab wilted. So what about me? How do I come on the scene? Actually, no. Let me take you back a little bit to the end of King Solomon's reign and to the glory days of Israel. 
God's amazing covenant promises made all those generations ago to Abraham had at least been partially fulfilled. God's people, the Israelites, were now vast in number. God's place, the promised land, is huge. Israel is as big as influential as it ever got and was a blessing to the other nations around it, just as God had promised to Abraham that we would be. The temple where God dwelt was awesome and they were living under the king, under God's rule and blessing. Except it all goes badly wrong. Solomon's wives led him astray to worship gods and I guess that's not surprising. He had hundreds of them which clearly went against what God had said and against common sense. Well, the next king should have been Solomon's son Rehoboam. Ah. Oh. But this young lad gets such bad advice and this kingdom of Israel, well, you'll know, it splits into the northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom Judah and instead of Israel being a united blessing to the nations, they end up being at war with each other and with the nations around them. Yes, there's plenty of ritual and temple worship. Yes, there's plenty of prosperity and wealth. But God isn't being honoured in their hearts and that's where the message of us prophets as covenant watchdogs got very unpopular our God given task is to stand before men and women as we've stood before God to receive our message and then to proclaim God's warning of judgment to come and there's always a choice for us his people there's always two possible outcomes Either the people can repent and turn back to God, who then promises through some wonderful pictures the hope that awaits us as we turn back to him. Or the king and the people can continue as they are, which will lead unavoidably to his terrible judgment. And the tragedy is that that's what keeps happening. So despite the almost endless warnings of my predecessors, like Amos and Hosea here in Israel, and like Isaiah and Micah in Judah, well, eventually, God won't hold back his judgment, and the warnings become reality. First, God's hand of judgment used the Assyrian Empire, which brutally conquered Israel in 722 BC. And then 150 years later, in 586 BC, it's the turn of the Babylonians to be used as God's rod of judgment, and us in Judah are conquered. Jerusalem is besieged, the temple is destroyed, and the people are led off into exile in Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And that exile lasted for about five decades until God relented and used King Cyrus. He used this pagan king to defeat the Babylonians. And King Cyrus wonderfully allows the exiles to return and to rebuild Jerusalem, their homes and the temple. And you can read all about that in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And that at last is where I come in. And I'm sure you know what year we're in. 29th August, 522 BC. Darius is now king in the Persian Empire and he's pretty relaxed about us being back in Jerusalem. But there's a problem. Yes, there's lots of joy at being back from the exile and even something of a carnival atmosphere. But there's also a problem. Please look again at my prophecy. Haggai 1 verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Man, it was a shock. And remember, most of us were just ordinary guys. Amos was a shepherd, even though he got messages about builders' plumb lines. Hosea had a tortured family life, that represented how the people had treated God. Isaiah worked in the temple. And then little old me. This is what the Lord Almighty said. The people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. 
Then the word of the Lord came through me, the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while my house remains a ruin? This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but have harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Wow. That's a clear enough picture. But God wasn't finished. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy building his own house. And that's the problem. As I look around Jerusalem, there's been lots of rebuilding, lots of loft conversions, conservatories, DIY SOS and grand designs, as everyone gets their own homes rebuilt after the whole place was destroyed in Nebuchadnezzar's siege. But no one's building God's house, the temple. It's still in ruins. And the encouraging thing is that on on this occasion back then, the people listened to me. Within a matter of days, the work on the temple started. And if you read Ezra, you'll see the rebuilding was completed just a few years later. Now, there was also another issue. Yes, the temple was rebuilt, as was Jerusalem and the city walls. But it wasn't a patch on how it was before the Babylonians trashed it. And some of the older folk knew it because they'd been there. They remembered it. Listen to what God told me to say to them. Chapter 2, verse 3. Ask them, said the Lord, who of you is left who saw my house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory says the Lord Almighty the silver is mine and the gold is mine declares the Lord Almighty the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house says the Lord Almighty and in this place I will grant peace declares the Lord Almighty cut now I'm going to come out of being Haggai now in case I'm now out of person whatever you call it when you're doing role play we're out of role play now we have to leave being Haggai behind I hope I wasn't too long in character by the way but as we now look on from Haggai his role as an Old Testament prophet is replaced by the New Testament by the Apostles those similarly chosen by Christ to be the great authoritative communicators of God's word and message. But how was Haggai's prophecy fulfilled? And what does it have to say to us today? How were any of the prophecies fulfilled? Well, they are all fulfilled ultimately in Christ. And in terms of time scale, these prophecies that as we look at them in the Old Testament, we sometimes get a bit confused. But they they can be like looking at mountain ranges disappearing into the distance. Do you know what I mean? So when you're you're walking and perhaps you're uh, in the hills, you can see a mountain range immediately in front of you. And that's like the first mountain range uh, of prophecy fulfilled then. 
The second mountain range, as you look beyond, you see another range beyond. And that's like another stage later on of prophecy being fulfilled. And sometimes we can look back at Christ's first coming and see that they've clearly been fulfilled. So, for instance, Micah's prophecies uh, prophesies that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. And these words of Haggai, promising, uh, and these words of Haggai, promising that God would come in even more glory, are wonderfully fulfilled as Christ comes in the flesh. So we get that second mountain range. Listen to God's uh, words uh, through the Apostle John in that famous opening chapter of his gospel. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Do you see the echoes here of that Haggai prophecy? We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then the author of Hebrews points us directly to the glory that would surpass the glory of the first temple. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So God no longer dwells in that temple back then, but in a person. The Lord Jesus Christ is the new temple. He's the fulfilment of that command in Haggai. He's the person through whom we come to the Father. And he gives us the same simple choice, who are just as rebellious as were the Israelites. That familiar verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The difference for us is that we don't have to build on an actual temple or church. So he's not telling us to, to come back here and build a proper church building. We don't have temple sacrifices to make because the Lord Jesus has sacrificed himself for us. We don't have to go to God uh, via a priest on our behalf because the Lord Jesus is our great high priest who made peace between God and sinful humanity with that sacrifice. So God's message from Haggai for us today isn't for us to go away and give all we have to your local church restoration project, although it may be useful with spires and PA systems that all need doing for the building in which you gather that is not necessarily the same place as where you are going to meet with God. We hope it is. But you don't need a building in which to meet him. It's something far more wonderful and inspiring. The new temple, as we've seen, is now the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the new Jerusalem is the new covenant people of God. The church, as the people of God not a building. And that comes, home to, that comes home to us every week as Grace Church meeting in a school hall. And God's message for us, though, is the same command that's in Haggai, to honour him still. Just as the people in Haggai's day were building their own homes but not the temple, so in our day, we honour God by building his church, by building his kingdom. And we do that by generosity of spirit, by selfless service, by loving one another, by knowing Christ and sharing Christ. By sharing Christ with those around us and by being concerned to deepen our knowledge and love of him. So let me encourage you, I'm sure that you're encouraged here to uh, be reading our Bibles daily using daily Bible reading notes and the like. Uh, it's very difficult, I know, to, or very easy to slip out of that habit and perhaps difficult to get back. Why not use Advent to start again? Get a series of Advent reflections or if you can't get hold of a little series, 
Just start reading a chapter of a gospel each and every day. Let's grow in our knowledge and love of Jesus. And let me say to my mind as I look at St. Thomas's, those are the marks of this church family that I've just mentioned. As you give generously and sacrificially to pray, to pay and pray for the ministry here. As you give to the poor and needy and support charities like Enfield Food Bank and I think the Night Shelter and more. As you give your time and energy to serve others uh, through a whole host of ministries, even without Christopher and before Rich and Claire arrive. It can be a time, an interregnum, of great building up of the body as you each take responsibility for looking out for each other in a way that perhaps isn't as possible or um, it's easy to uh, throw the responsibility back onto the vicar. Actually, when there's no vicar around, we have to pick the things up ourselves. And that's good for us. And it seems to me you're doing that admirably. Sacrificial service and wholeheartedness in response to God's amazing love and his grace for us in Christ is the message of Haggai and indeed all the prophets. And some of those elements of the prophecy of Haggai are that third mountain range that we still wait for in the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul similarly spoke God's word to God's people in his letter to the Philippians as to how we're to be in the here and now. And let me finish with this famous old hymn uh, from the church in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Your attitude, as he speaks to the Christians then, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let me pray for us. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you that in Christ you have brought us close to you, not through a temple but through your grace and through faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that you give us your Spirit that assures us of your presence with us. Please would you send us out now in the power of your Spirit when we go from here in a few moments' time to honour you and to live and to work to your praise and glory. And give us eyes never to forget the horizon of Christ coming again and returning in all his glory. <clears throat>